Okay, uh, my name is Steve Mays from Soulwise, and what I'm going to do now is a video um, going through a, a hands-on setup and configuration of uh, of a neutron system. This is a MiFi managed solution from Ingenious. So this is basically a series of PowerPoints, and I'll go through each PowerPoint uh, discussing the configuration as we go through. And on the next video, what I'll do then is actually get some kit out, set it up on a desk and do a real, real hands on. So this is basically more of a talk through some PowerPoint slides. So uh, just to recap, so the Neutron system consists of uh, a management switch. So this is a high power, uh, high power by that I mean software power um, switch from Ingenious, a um, number of different LAN ports, you can get 8 port ones and 24 port ones and blah blah blah, different number of SFP ports etc. So this is a, uh, a very sophisticated, high, a very powerful switch and what Ingenious have done is they've then um, added onto that switch the application of functionality to do AP management of the neutron access points. And the neutron access points, you've got a selection of indoor ones. There's about 10 of those or something like that. You, there's about 10 different switches to choose from. And there's about half a dozen outdoor access points as well. Uh, with different part, different types of uh, Wi-Fi speed, 5 gig, 2.4 gig, 11 AC, and even way 2, etc. So these are the key building blocks of your uh, neutron managed Wi-Fi system. Mm. So stage one of the configuration is you need to make sure you've chosen, chosen suitable access points. So do you need indoor, outdoor? Do you want 2.4 gig, uh, 5 gig? Are you happy with 11N or do you want to go for 11AC or now even the choice is 11AC wave 2 access points? Uh, also you need to choose your uh, neutral management switch. Um, now that can be a PoE switch or it can be a non-PoE switch. Um, if it's PoE, just make sure you choose one which has the correct PoE budget. Uh, by that I mean, make sure that the total PoE capacity of the switch suits the uh, number and the power of the access points that you'll be connecting to it. So don't choose a PoE switch that only has, let's say, a 60 watt output and then try and plug into it sort of, you know, four access points needing 30 watts each because it just ain't going to work. Make sure you choose a switch which has got the correct number of ports and um, this comes down to distributed switches. Um, I'm personally a big fan of instead of putting one dirty great big monster switch in, um, uh, break it down into a series of smaller switches spread across the site where those smaller switches are then connected by a, a high speed backbone. Um, if you end up, if you have a single switch with lots of ports, then that really makes all the wiring coming back to that switch really complicated. Um, also, it's a case of putting all your eggs in one basket. If that switch goes wrong, and you know, with the will, best will in the world, something can go wrong. You know, somebody may even kick, kick out a mains lead or something like that. Um, you know, if, if the main switch goes wrong, then it can be. Uh, can be a lot less painful if instead of using one great big switch you've used distributed switches around the, around the site and it does say it does make the wiring a lot easier as well so let's go back to that idea of uh, making sure you get your uh, poe budget correct now this is just showing a uh, some examples of a few access points and some examples of some switches so this is not a definitive list of access points it's not a definitive list of switches it's just showing some examples so what they're saying is if you went for the 5912, which is the uh, the most popular um, PoE neutron switch that we sell, uh, it's got eight LAN ports on it and a total budget of 130 watts. So that means that you could, for example, put eight EWS310 access points on it without exceeding that PoE budget. But you wouldn't be able to put as many of the uh, top of the range or higher up EWS360 access points because they need more power. So even though you've got eight LAN ports, you can only physically uh, power wise cope with eight, sorry, with six of these high power access points. And yet again, this is just showing a similar example here. Uh, depending upon the PoE budget, we can actually put more and more higher power access points on without actually exceeding that budget. So we can go right up here, for example, to this big boy here with 740 watts with that. 
Um, you've got 48 ports on it, so you could um, use all 48 ports for some of the lower power uh, access points. But even then, if you want some of these high power ones, like these 360s here, which are over 30 watts each, yet again, you've got a limitation on the number of access points you can put in. So all this is basically saying is, whichever switch you choose, whichever access points you choose, just make sure you've thought about the amount of power you're going to need for those PoE access points. Stage two, uh, install the amount of hardware, running network network cables. If there's any existing third party infrastructure, then sort out the connectivity to that. You'll probably think about internet connectivity for the Neutron system because the Neutron system will actually do um, firmware updates, automatic checking from the internet. It's also got capabilities to do um, email, uh, warning emails if something goes wrong via the internet. So you're going to need some form of internet connectivity probably for the Neutron system. Um, and the first stage is um, connect your uh, Neutron switch up, power your Neutron switch up, but at the initial stage, my advice is don't connect up and don't power up your access points yet. It makes it easier to my rather simple mind to do this in a multi-stage process. So what I say is get the controller sorted out first of all. Once you've got the controller sorted out, by that I mean any firmware updates, any IP settings, then start adding the access points to the system. So, stage three. Now, stage three is all to do with the initial connection of the controller to the network. So, out of the box, the Neutron controllers are on the default address 192.168.0.0.0. And the login address is 192.168.0.239. So, of course, you understand IP settings, don't you? So you understand that in order to actually connect to the controller on 192.168.0.239, then the PC that you're using must be on that 0. Dot blah 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 network. I say that, you'd be surprised how many phone calls you get from people who have said, oh, I can't connect to the controller, it must be faulty, I demand a free charge replacement, blah blah blah. And it's all down to the fact that they haven't checked the IP address of the PC that they are using to connect to the controller. What they normally happens is they put the control on the network, they put their PC on the network, their PC gets a DHCP address from the main network, which is nothing like the 192.168.0. blah 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 subnet. Consequence, they can't connect to the controller. So it may be that for the initial setup, you have to manually give your PC a static address on that 0.xxx range. Assuming you've done that, you can then log into the controller on 0239, enter the default username and password, which is admin and password, and then we can go through the process of checking the PoE and checking the bandwidth settings on that controller. So, stage one. You've got your IP settings sorted out for your PC, you've got the controller on the network, you've got your PC on the network. You can now go to the 192.168.0239 address, so if it's working according to plan, up pops the config page, login page for the controller. And now you can use the default username of admin and password to get into the controller. Now, remember I said in previous videos that what we're talking about here is um, this is a very sophisticated, very powerful switch to which Ingenious have added the Neutron controller functionality. OK, so when you log into the switch, you'll find that you've got two modules. You've got controller and switch. And by default, it comes up to the controller. So this is the neutron stuff. OK, now the first thing you're going to probably want to do is go into the switch configuration to check things like, for example, the IP address used by the controller switch on the network. So what you do is you click on switch. That takes you into the switch module. You've now got access to all of the functionality of the switch part of the controller. Okay, so you've got all the layer two, all the VLAN, access control, it's all the QoS, all this high power stuff that you expect to see on any decent, respectable uh, management switch. First thing you need to do is go into the IP settings to make sure that the IP address of the switch suits the network that you're running on. So you go into IP settings, you go to IPv4. 
So in here, we can actually configure the um, IP address that we want to give the switch. So I say the default is 0239. So what you can do on here is you can modify the settings, the IP settings, the default gateway and the DNS, etc. of the switch to suit the network that you're operating on. So in this example, we've changed the settings from 0239 to 1.100. We've ensured that default gateway is right. We've ensured that there's a DNS server entry on there. We can now apply and that will you start using the switch on these new settings. Now remember, if you changed the IP settings of your PC to the zero network so that you could then gain access and into the configuration of the uh, controller. So if you change the address of the controller, you need to change the address settings of your PC back again. All right. Once you've done all that, anyway, you can click on apply and um, that's the IP settings set for the switch. Now, other things that you can do, which you may or may not want to look at initially on the switch configuration, is going to the PoE. Now, if it's a non-PoE switch, then forget about that, because obviously or none of this exists. But assuming it's a PoE switch, then you now have the options to go in and look at the PoE port settings for the switch. So when you go in here, you have the full... Um, management of the poe output for each of the LAN ports on the switch okay so not only can we set whether we want to enable or disable the poe we can also set the priority now what that means is if the uh, access points or devices that you connect to the switch are pulling too much power which ports do you want to actually want to start turning off so you've got low priority ports and high priority ports you can set the power limit on the actual ports, whether you want it done automatically or whether you want to manually set the power limit. And also here, it's just telling us the status of some devices that are actually connected already to the switch. So you've got full PoE control through this screen. And the other thing worth mentioning at this stage is the bandwidth control. So this is the PoE output power control, but we've also got bandwidth control. And the bandwidth control we can actually set the total um, data throughput um, for the LAN port. So if there's an access point connected to a, any specific port, this is, gives, gives us the ability to actually completely control the net input speed and the net output speed going to the access point as a whole. So this is a way of controlling directly the maximum amount of bandwidth available for an access point connected to a specific LAN port on the switch. So it's fairly self-explanatory. You select the port and you can select the um, ingress speed maximum and the egress speed maximum. So rather self-explanatory really. You probably want to set this, to be honest, just disabled and let it just sit there going as fast as it can. But the option is there if you need it. And I will be mentioning this bandwidth control later on in the video. So stage four of the controller setup is checking the firmware. Now, you may have noticed on some of the previous slides that there's been this little indicator box in the top right hand corner with a little red number on it. This is telling us that there's a firmware update available. Now I've been ignoring this so far because until we've got things like the IP settings all set up, then this is irrelevant. OK, because you can't do that until you've got all your IP settings set up first. So first of all, go into the switch, set up the IP settings. Once that's done and the switch is rebooted and restarted, you've logged into it. You'll notice if there's a firm update available within a couple of minutes, you should get an indication here. Now, I'll be perfectly frank, there nearly always is a firmware required. The reason is, is because um, these products are coming from Singapore. And by the time they come by ocean from Singapore into Europe, by the time they come through from Europe to us, the product could invariably be uh, four months before it left the factory. Uh, now, Ingenious have a policy of uh, frequent firmware updates for the products. Now, this is a good thing because it's very, 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 very rare that a firmware upgrade is a bad thing. It's nearly always a good thing on the Ingenious product, i.e adding extra functionality and extra features. So um, there's a policy of frequent feature updates and additions. 
So it does mean that nine times out of 10, when you've got to this screen, you'll find that there's a firmware update available. So this is saying, hey, there's one firmware update, or update available for this network, so for this controller. So to apply that firmware update, you click on that button there. And then what it does is it comes to this screen here, showing you that, hey, look, your switch, which is an EWS 7928P, I've got one firmware update available for it. Click update, it will then apply that firmware update to the switch. It's warning you, by the way, this is going to reboot the switch, etc. You then sit around waiting for two or three minutes while it actually does the update. And you've got a box here so you can show more information, more details of it going through doing the firmware update. So blah, 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 blah. And at the end, it reboots and restarts and you re-log back in again. And after it's logged back in, hopefully that firmware update icon will be missing. I, there's no firmware update available. It's all up to date. So, stage five. Stage five is what we do is we connect the access points to the network and then go through the association of those access points to the controller and then we can check the firmware for those access points. Okay, so what we should now do is uh, say now power up and connect all the access points to the network. Now, as the access points boot up, so they'll uh, declare themselves to the controller and the controller will then detect them and list these access points which are available for management. So we go to, under device management, we go to access points and any access points that have been detected will be shown here. And to bring these access points under the management of this controller, what we do is we have to select the access points and then click on add. So select the access points, click on add. Now what it does is it says, okay, well, if I'm bringing these access points under the control of the controller, what do you want to do about the IP address? Do you want to leave it as DHCP? My advice is do. Um, the reason I'm saying do is because you don't really care what addresses the access points get because the management of the access points is all done through the controller, okay? So you don't care what, access, what IP address they get. Now, DHCP therefore is fine. And what this means is give the access points an address derived from your main DHCP server on your network. The addresses are not dished out by the controller. They are the ones dished out by your main DHCP server, which nine times out of 10 is your internet router or your router somewhere or your firewall. You do have the option if you want to put static addresses in. So you can, if you want, say, right, give these a static address in this range and set up these settings and then click apply. So you've got static or you've got DHCP. I always stick with DHCP because I'm all for an easy life. Once you've done that, it then goes through a process of going through the connection of the controller to each access point in turn. And it will check the firmware update and it will check the configuration of the access points to get them all to a common flat platform. And once it's got the access points connected, just like it did with the controller, it would now go through a process of checking the firmware to make sure the firmware on the access points is bang up to date and suitable for the controller. Sometimes if the access points have got quite old firmware on, it'll come up and say incompatible. Now what it basically means is they need a firmware update. And to do that, you can just sit around for a couple of minutes and wait for the automatic firmware update button to appear on the top right. Or you can go down to maintenance. Just to jig it along. I'll come to the uh, firmware update through manually options later on in the video. So stage six. Stage six, we want to create an AP group. Now, at this stage, we can actually go through and set up the configuration of each access point individually. But you don't want to do that. What you want to do is you want to do it as a group of access points. 
Invariably, what you want is when you're setting up a site with a number of access points, you'll be grouping the access points under a common configuration. Now, that be, could be per floor, it could be per building, for example. And once we've got a group of, config, of access points, what we'll then do is you want to do a common configuration of those access points which are part of that group, be it the country, the radio settings, the SSID, and security, for example. So this is just reiterating the concept of actually having groups of access points, where you can have a group of access points, in this case we've got a group A and a group B, um, which can be for different floors or, or different buildings, but they have similar characteristics. So all the group A access points might have the same SSID settings and the same security, which can be different from the group B access points. And a typical example is where you have multiple floors. With multiple floors, you may want uh, different settings for access points per floor that the access points are located on. So, let's go create a group. So we go down to device management and we click on AP group. Obviously out of the box, we haven't got any groups defined yet. So we click on add to create a group. Comes up with the um, add group screen. So on here we want to give it a name for the group. I don't know, floor one remote building, annex, whatever. It also will then list you the access points, which are, now these are access points which are being managed under the control of the neutron controller, but haven't at this stage been assigned to a group, all right? So what you do is you can select the access points and then click on add, and that moves these access points from being none group allocated to being part now of this new group that you've just created. Okay. Now let's go through the common settings that you'll probably want to do to that group. So the uh, next thing that you'll probably want to do is go through the process of actually doing um, setting up the radio settings for it. All right. So you click on radio settings, under radio settings you'll want to select the country, so you go and select the country. When you come to United Kingdom you'll notice that there's three bands, uh, or three countries for UK. There's UK, which is the indoor band, there's UK band B, which is indoor and outdoor, and there's UK band C, which is outdoor license type stuff. So forget about UK band C, because that's, that's, that's a license stuff, that's for point to point linking. So uh, UK uh, band B is the preferred choice because UK band B means indoor and outdoor and gives you the maximum usage of all the 5G channels and um, a healthy dose of extra RF power compared to the indoor 5G channels. So usually I tell people collect UK band B. Um, once we've done that, then we can go through and check the uh, WLAN settings for 2.4 and the WLAN settings for 5 gig. So let's go to the WLAN settings for 2.4. Under there, we notice that there are eight SSIDs. So there's eight SSIDs individually configurable for the 2.4 and a similar eight for the 5. By default, only the first SSID is enabled and each SSID has a individual settings for security and isolation and VLAN tagging. So let's just click on the first SSID to show you the sort of settings that you're going to see in here. So under the SSID configuration, you've got the tools to um, change the SSID name. So at this stage, we'll just worry about changing the name to something uh, suitable. And we're going to scroll down the screen and we're going to go straight to the WPA2 PSK security. And on here, we can actually enter a uh, security uh, password for the, uh, for the WPA2. And then we click on save. We can then go ahead and do exactly the same thing for the 5 gig SSID. And once we've done all that, we can click on apply. And once we click on apply, it will then create that group. And these settings that we've set up, this configuration that we created, will then be applied to those access points which are members of this group. Done. 
So what that means is that um, any time we do any changes now to that group, all those access points which are part of that group will automatically get those configurations applied to it. So now we can go on to the next stage of the configuration. Okay, so let's still go through the various advanced configuration settings um, for the neutron system. So what we'll do is, or what I'll do here is I'll talk about roaming, isolation, bandwidth client limiting, traffic shaping, LED control, band steering, and background scanning. So let's go to the first one. Roaming. Oh, I hate roaming. I hate roaming. I hate roaming. Right. Um, we all think we know about roaming, but very few of us actually do know about roaming. So the simple concept is client connect to access point number one. As it moves around the building, it wants to automatically hop across to different access points. So that's the theory. In practice, it's not so easy. Um, the first thing to bear in mind is that when it comes from access point hopping for a client, it is the client that makes the decision if, when to hop or to roam. So uh, what the client does is it's constantly monitoring its connection to the access point, you know, signal strength, number of errors, retries, blah, 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 blah. And when it chips to a certain threshold, it goes, oh, I don't like this access point anymore. I'm going to start looking around for another access point to connect to. Hopefully then, after it's had a little bit of a look around, it'll find a suitable access point and then uh, and then connect to that one. So fine in theory. The problem is that um, the process of deciding that the connection is rubbish and then having a look around to what to connect to and then actually doing the migration process can turn out to be quite long winded. Um, as it happens, actually, the process of having a look around and actually doing the migration process is not the big issue. It's that preamble before where the client's going, oh, shall I, shan't I, shall I, shan't I? Oh, no, is it OK? Oh, no, it's not OK. So during that sort of, um, you know, sat there with its uh, with its thumb up, it's whatever. During that process, during that interval, then the connection's getting worse and worse and worse. You started to get drop packets, lost data, that sort of thing. Now, if it's what I would call normal internet usage, what people normally do nowadays, or I'm told they do on the nowadays, so we're talking about a bit of Facebook, a bit of Twitter, a bit of checking your eBay listings, using a couple of apps to, apps to buy online from Amazon, that sort of thing, then uh, those uh, time delays inherent in the roaming process don't really matter that much. To be honest, they don't even matter if you're doing things like streaming YouTube videos because the uh, buffering inherent YouTube videos, which can be anything up to 30 seconds, is so extensive that even if there was a break in the signal for several seconds, your YouTube video usually won't notice, won't, won't stream any differently. Um, now, there are applications where um, there is, yeah, they are time critical with this migration process, and essentially these are VoIP applications. So when you're doing uh, VoIP calls through your handset, through your client device, then um, you're much more, uh, it's much more critical that you get a clean handover between the access points. So there are some protocols to try and streamline this process. So yet again, it's still the client that decides if it's going to want to roam. But once it does roam, there are two protocols um, uh, built into the access points called 811K and 811R, which will try and streamline that process. 811R is the one that's been around the longest. Now that basically is, is it's, uh, it means you've got fast security handover. Um, Going back to my example, when the client has decided it actually wants to hop across, after it's had a look around and decided which access point to go to, the next stage is it needs to break with the first access point and then start a security negotiation with the second access point. So there's a period of time there where there's a gap in connectivity. Now with 8 to 11 r what happens is after the client has decided it wants to move around and after it's chosen the access point it wants to hop to, then while still maintaining its connection to the first access point, it can negotiate through the network of the first access point the security handshake with the second access point. So it's talking through its existing connection to negotiate effectively through the LAN connection of the second access point the security protocol required. 
So that's up called 802.11r. And yet again, that's after the client has decided to move and made a decision about which access points it wanna to, want to connect to, then the R process steps in to actually streamline that security handshake. And that all knock, knocks, knocks it down from, I don't know, typically sort of 30 milliseconds down to about 10 milliseconds for that hop across. The other protocol uh, I'm talking about here is called H11K. Um, now, yet again, after the client has decided it wants to start moving around or looking for a different access point, the usual process is it goes to a process of breaking the connection with the first access point, having a quick look around, reconnect to the first access point, have a quick look around, and it carries on having a quick look around, going through all the channels, checking the available access points that it can see, checking the security on them to see which one it wants to actually hop across to. That obviously takes time. The other issue is all of this untoward client scanning and going through all the channels in the in the in the, in the background is increasing the interference inherent in the Wi-Fi network as well. Now, what an 811K does to try and simplify that process is once the client has decided it wants to move, you know, as I keep on stressing that, it's once the client has decided it wants to move, then what happens is the client, assuming it's K compliant, can ask the access point that it's currently connected to, give me a data list or a data block telling me all about the access points in the vicinity so I don't have to go off and manually look for them. So when that happens, the data block comes back from the access point, which gives the client information about all the access points in the vicinity, what their SSIDs are, what the channels are, blah, 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 blah. So that information is all avail made available to the client without it having to break its connection from access point number one. So from that data block, the client can choose a suitable access point. It can then go using 802.11r, go through a process of pre-negotiation for the security. And once that's all out of the way, then it can hop across. Of course, assuming that the access the client has made a speedy choice or a speedy decision that it actually wants to do any roaming in the first place. That's just a graphical representation just showing you, look, here's the client connected access point number one. It's talking through the network to access point number two, uh, arranging the Wi-Fi security, which is mainly uh, it's saved less than, it's, it's knocked about 50 milliseconds off the actual migration process. So this is what we call fast roaming. Oh, excuse me, I must have a, I must have a sip of my espresso before it goes cold. Hmm. Catch your machine strikes again. Okay, fast roaming. So this is what Ingenious have labelled the basically the K and R part. So to set up fast roaming, what we do is we it's an access point feature. So we go into the AP groups and we go to WLN settings. We choose the SSID. Now this fast roaming only applies to the first SSID in the 2.4 or the 5 gigs. So you select the SSID. And once you've selected the SSID, uh, select the SSID, then we go down here the SSID config, and you've got this option called fast roaming. Now notice it says you must be using these two types of security, so that's all coming down to the 802.11r part, because 802.11r, remember, is a security handshake roaming protocol. So you've got to have WPA2 uh, mix enterprise or PSA security enabled in order for this to actually work. So anyway, assume you've got your Wi-Fi security set up, which you probably will have anyway. You just click on uh, enable fast roaming. And this is just reiterating, yes, you need to have the security set up in order for this to work. And you click on save and that's applied to the access points in the group. Right. Client isolation. So there are two types of client isolation. There's basic client isolation, which means client A can't see client B connected to the same access point. So both A and B here are connected to this access point in the middle, and with client isolation enabled, they can't see each other. However, there's nothing at this stage to stop A going down the network and seeing D, or A going down the network through the other access point and seeing C. So if you want to block that, you have to enable layer two isolation. So with layer two isolation, A can't see C and D and vice versa. And with client isolation, 
client A can't sue client B or any other access, any other client connected to the same access point. So um, two different types of isolation. Now the reason it's split into two different types is there are some instances where you do want client A to see other clients on the network. And one of the prime ones is if client A has to see a network printer connected onto the network. Let's say client D is actually a HP printer. So if this is a printer acting as a client, then A, if you put layer two new isolation on here, won't be able to actually connect to that printer. So you have to check where, which sort of isolation you want and whether it's viable to actually enable it. So anyway, let's look and see where you actually enable it. Yet again, this is an SSID configuration. Under SSID configuration for your chosen SSID, you notice you've got tick boxes for client isolation and layer two isolation. So just select what you want and then click on save to store the settings. Right, bandwidth control. Now I did have actually already covered this previously right at the start of this video. So bandwidth control is done through the switch and it's under QoS. If we go down to bandwidth control, this enables us to actually control the net throughput of data to and from the access point through that port on the switch. So it's a control of the traffic on the port and hence a control of the total traffic going in and out of the access point. So it's not per SSID, it's not per client, it's per access point bandwidth control. Uh, the other tool we've got here available is uh, client limiting. So this is just limiting the number of users that can connect to the access point. Now, this is one of the ways whereby you can ensure that um, you don't end up with a situation where you have far too many clients connected to one access point when there's another one just four yards away not being used or being underutilized. So you can actually set a maximum limit of the number of clients that can connect per access point. So what happens is, let's say you set the client limit to, uh, pick a figure at the end, 50, 50 clients on, the, on an access point. If the 51st comes along to try to connect, then basically it will, it will be refused and that will force that client then to look for another access point to connect to. That's under radio settings on the uh, group setup. So we've got a radio settings and here it is under the three bands, so 2.45 gig and 11 AC. The default is 127, so all you need to do is set that down to uh, more sensible values. I don't know, 50 or something like that, or 30, whatever. So that's client limitation. Traffic shaping. Now, this is basically a QoS per SSID. Remember, literally what two slides ago, two slides ago we showed, we talked about bandwidth uh, shaping per port, per access point. This is traffic shaping per SSID. So this is bandwidth control per SSID. So this is how we can actually put limits on the upload and download speed per SSID be on the five gig and or 2.4. Yet again, it's an SSID uh, function. So under the group, we go down to the particular SSID that we want to set up, select it, go into its configuration, and there you see you have traffic shaping, enabled or disabled. So this is the total amount of traffic on the SSID. It's not per user, it's per all the users on the SSID. So set the value what you want, click on save. You then save the settings to that config, to that group. The other thing that people often want to do is they want to turn off the LEDs on the access points. So that's under the advanced settings of the group. So under group advanced, here you have LED control. So you can enable or disable the LEDs. And right, this is probably a more useful function to turn LEDs off. Band steering. <clears throat> now, the 2.4 gig spectrum, as you all know, is clogged to whatever. It hasn't got enough channel space and uh, there's far too many products or clients connected to it. Five gig is a much more open uh, uh, spectrum area. There's a lot more free channels. Uh, there's no channel overlap. Um, so it has the capability to cope with a much higher performance and a much higher client count. Now what band steering means is um, assuming your access points are dual band and assuming that your client is dual band, 
If a client tries to connect to a dual band access point of 2.4, what happens is the access point interrogates the client, finds out if it's capable of doing 5 gig. If it is, then you can tell the access point under those conditions or under those circumstances to push that client over to the 5 gig. In that way, you're trying to clear up the 2.4 gig and push the clients onto the much wider frequency band, uh, which can cope with a much higher number of clients. So all we do is uh, the client tries to connect. Is it 5 gig compatible? No. Well, no, no problem then, say on the 2.4. If it is, let's try and push it over to the 5 gig. So what this does is it reduces the traffic on the 2.4 gig, reduces congestion on the 2.4 gig, and uh, facilitates that client to get a much potentially a much higher Wi-Fi connection and throughput. So to set that up, uh, that's just another picture saying the thing. Oh look, we've got loads of people on the 2.4. Let's try to do some uh, band steering and equalize the spread. So that's all that's saying, right. So it's under the advanced settings again for the group. If we go uh, under the advanced settings, under LED control, the next option down, we've got band steering and the options are prefer five gig. So encourage the client to go to five gig, force the client to go to five gig, or try and equalize the client spread between the 2.4 and the five gig. Um, my advice is just choose prefer five gigs. So you don't want to be too forceful because something might go wrong. You might find that the client actually refuses to go on five gig. I can't think of a reason why it might do, but it might do. So if you do prefer five gig, then if the client tries to connect at 2.4, it will just be coerced to go onto the five gig band. Next thing down my list is RSSI threshold. So I've mentioned it again and again and again that when it comes to roaming or hopping of client from access point number one to access point number two, it is the client that decides if it's time to move. Uh, and it does that based upon signal strength, quality of the signal, number of packet retries, etc., etc., etc. Now, sometimes you can get clients which are very, very sticky. Um, they have to be really, 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 really bad connection for them to decide, oh, it's time to give up and let's find another access point to connect to. Um, some clients are better at this than others. Um, but if you get a client or in a situation where clients are refusing to hop across, even when the signal is quite poor, then you can actually do this thing called RSSI threshold setting. It is to be discouraged, but it is it is a setting available in the setup. What it basically means is if you set an RSSI, RSSI threshold on the access points, then if the signal that the access point sees from a client drops below that threshold, it'll kick that client off. That will then force the client to have a look around and see if there's a better access point to connect to. So the key thing there was you need to ensure that there is a better access point for the client to connect to, or once it's kicked off, it will go, oh, there's nothing better and it will try to connect the first access point again and so it would sit there without bouncing backwards and forwards, bouncing backwards and forwards. Uh, the other issue you've got is um, if this client, so the client doesn't know anything that this is going to happen, it thinks it's just chatting along, albeit quite poorly, to the first access point. All of a sudden its connection is broken and um, it's, it's, it's arse is in the air, as so to speak. It's in the wind, it's going, oh my god, I'm stuck out there in the big bad world. So if that client was halfway through doing some sort of data transfer or looking at something, I don't know, streaming a video and that sort of thing, whatever, all of a sudden there'll be a break in that traffic. So what this does is uh, it makes a complete kibosh of doing any form of seamless roaming. You've broken that connection. The client, the first thing it knows about it is all of a sudden its Wi-Fi signal drops down to zero. Oh, what am I going to do about it? So it then starts looking around, tries to find another access point to connect to, and then goes through the negotiation process. So you can see this is a big break in the connectivity for this client. I say a big break. It might be, I don't know, one or two seconds or something like that. And it may well be that if you're doing normal stuff that people do on the internet nowadays, or so I'm told, such as Facebook, Twitter, other buzzwords like that, that I don't really know what they mean then they may or may not naturally notice that that break in the traffic. But if they're involved in something like a VoIP call, then this sort of kicking the client off is to be discouraged because it will make a real disruption to any VoIP call that was going along. Now, 
with some clients, you can actually tune the capability to uh, to roam anyway um, without requiring this feature. It's called what they call it has a generic term called a roaming aggressiveness. So with roaming aggressiveness, uh, you can actually um, adjust the tendency of the client at least to make up its own mind that it doesn't like the access point it's connected to. Now with Android devices, you can actually download an app which will allow you to tune the roaming aggressiveness on your um, on your client device. Uh, I'm not aware of any similar thing that you can do with Apple devices. So, another good reason to go Android. Anyway, if you want to actually control the RSSI threshold, that's under the advanced settings in the group. Go to advanced settings, under band steering, we've got RSSI threshold. Tick the box, put a suitable value in. Minus 70 is the uh, recommended value. That's sort of the cutoff point between an OK network and a rubbish network. Um, that what you can do uh, before you start playing around with that is you can just go and look at the um, monitoring tools to look at the signal strength that access points are seeing from clients in order for you to make an educated assessment of to what actual RSSI value to use. So for example, if you're finding that all your clients are um, quite regularly dropping to quite weak signals, then you don't want to make that value Two, two out of the ballpark because you might end up with clients floundering around without anything to connect to. So anyway, RSSI threshold. So let's go to the next one. Right, background scanning. Now background scanning is a really powerful feature built into Neutron. With background scanning, what happens is each access point is regularly polling the surrounding Wi-Fi environment to ensure that it's operating on the best channel and or best RF power to ensure that it's given the maximum coverage with a minimum interference. So what that means is that at regular intervals, and I think off the top of my head the default is 30 seconds, an access point will very quickly break off what it's doing. And I stress, this is very, very quick. You won't notice any breaks in traffic throughput than that. So it breaks off what it's doing, has a very quick look around, then continues with its with its normal operation so every 30 seconds it breaks has a look at a channel comes back again and each break it goes look at the next channel on the list so for example if it's 2.4 gig uh, and it's every 30 seconds so there's 13 channels so every roughly uh, six and a half minutes six minutes it's gone through every single channel so at the end of that six and a half minutes or six minutes worth of looking it has made a decision as to uh, what the environment is. Is it on the best channel? Is it on the best RF power? Now, what it can do is if it decides that there's a better channel for it to be on, it can actually then change the channel that it's operating on. Now, you don't have to worry if the channel changes as far as the clients are concerned, because there's another protocol, which I think it's called 802.11f, or is it H? No, 802.11h. H rings a bell. But anyway, there's another protocol that kicks in, which basically means um, if the access point is about to change channel, it can pre-warn the client. So the client is pre-warned about the fact that there's a channel change about to happen. So the uh, at the same time as the access point changes, the client can seamlessly change at the same time. So all the traffic flow carries on uninterrupted. But now, hopefully, you're on a channel which is better as far as uh, interference is concerned. Uh, so that's under device management wireless services. So device management wireless services, do you want a background scan for 2.4 and or 5 gig? The duration for each look around. So this is saying every 30 seconds, hop off and have another look at another channel. And by default, TX power, so this is auto control of the RF power is disabled. So what that means is if this was enabled, not only would the access point dynamically control the channel, it was also dynamically control the transmit power. Now, although channel hopping is okay and wouldn't cause any untoward effects, suddenly changing the RF power could cause an effect. Because if you've got a client that's suddenly connected to the, is connected to the access point and all of a sudden the power it's receiving from the access point halves, it's going to go, oh my God, oh my God, and the connection is going to start playing up. So by default, this is not enabled. So um, I normally advise people, enable this when the system is first put in, 
after it's been running for a couple of days or 24 hours or something like that, then turn this off again. So it's had time to actually try find out what the optimum power is, um, but don't leave it permanently enabled, otherwise you might find clients um, magically dropping out of thin air, etc., etc. Et now, in order for both these uh, automatic um, channel and automatic RF to work, then you must have set the channel and the RF power to auto in the actual original radio configuration part of the access point group. If you fix the channel or you fix the RF power, then both these settings, settings won't actually have any effect. So let's go through the monitoring tools. There's a whole pile of monitoring tools, topology views, map views, client logging, AP monitoring, email events, blah, blah, blah. So let's just go, go from the beginning and start go through these. So under visualization, there's topology view. Topology view gives us a, a made up schematic of the network as a whole. So here's an example. At the beginning, we've got the neutron switch. We've got another switch here. And these are access points. And this is an IP camera. So these are access points actually connected to the network. Now, if it's an ingenious switch, it can give you information like the, uh, the name and the IP address, etc. of the switch. If it's a third party switch, all it does is draw a little square and puts a question mark next to it. But it will still give you a, a rough topology map of the overall network. So you can see what's going on. And this is uh, the exclamation mark saying this topology hasn't been saved yet. And the little green circles here mean that these access points are online. And the zero means the number of connected clients at this particular time. So this is just saying topology change. So this is saying you haven't saved this topology yet. So if you click on save topology, then this layout is actually stored on it until until something changes in the environment, in which case it's time to do another topology change. A save, but save topology. Okay, so once you do save topology, those exclamation marks disappear. And we can zoom in. So there's controls on this actual screen to actually zoom in and look at more detail on the topology map. So here we have, we zoomed into that switch that was on the bottom. And we can actually get some more information about this switch by zooming in. So, for example, a box here comes up link to switch. So if we connect link to switch, we can actually go directly into the configuration of the switch. Another good reason for you to be using ingenious products throughout the actual network. And if we actually click on any of the access points in the network, little box pops up with some more information, MAC address, channel, blah, blah, blah. And also a little menu so that we can quickly go into the uh, group cluster management of this access point. So you don't have to worry about trying to guess which group it's a member of. You can go straight into its group configuration from this screen. Right, map view. So map view is a tool that you can use to give you a visual representation of where your access points are, uh, external access points are uh, arranged outside. So map view uh, links into Google and it allows you to um, scroll around the maps of the world until you find the map that actually covers your area. And once you've done that, so you've chosen a map and obviously this is just the off-the-shelf one that's actually built into the device and obviously this shows somewhere in Singapore or somewhere like that I'm guessing but anyway it'll do for this so once you've chosen your map you can do AP list AP list gives you a selection of access points available for you to place on the map so all you do is you click and drag your access point over onto the map at your chosen location once you've done that, then you can do save map and that is actually saved. So this is really just a visual, visual memory jogger of where your access points are, where you've arranged them. Probably more, uh, more relevant is the floor view. This is the tool whereby you can upload plans of the different floors of your building or buildings. And yet again, we can put the access points onto the floor drawings 
So the first comment coming to it, obviously there are no, no uh, floor plans uh, stored into it. So we go to upload floor plan, click on add. We can then uh, select a name for this floor plan image, choose a file and upload it. And there we are. So this is two that I uploaded previously. So we've got one called ground floor, one called second floor, and we can click on one of these and click on the little um, pencil at the end to edit them. So for example, if we do the ground floor, here we are on the ground floor. So here's a picture of the ground floor map. Um, and just like we did with the outdoor map views, we can select AP list. That will give us the APs. We can then pick up the APs and copy them onto the map. Now, <clears throat> you notice that we've put an AP on the map and it's gone and draw this fantastic um, heat map RF coverage thing. The problem with the RF coverage thing that's built into Neutron is it's pretty useless. And the reason why it's useless is it doesn't take into account at all any signal degradation or signal loss due to actually walls. You notice that it doesn't matter whether the signal is going this way or this way, there's no degradation on this contour map for the RF signal. So that's not really very informative. Um, now, Ingenious though have actually got a really good um, RF coverage map, which is available uh, online from the um, Singapore Ingenious website. And that actually is a much more powerful tool that allows you to upload maps, allows you to place access points, obviously ingenious access points onto the actual uh, map, and allows you to set the RF power for the access points. And more importantly, what it will do is it will allow you to actually specify what materials the various walls are made out of. And um, it has a built-in table for the RF attenuation for each of these wall types that you can put in, including walls, different types of doors. It's got stud walls. It's got brick walls. It's got concrete walls, blah, 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 blah. So, and that's a very powerful tool because what that does is it actually draws you um, RF coverage maps, which are correctly or pretty closely uh, attenuated um, but depending upon the wall materials and they have tools which actually have walls for indoor use and they also have tools for outdoor use so uh, trees and that sort of thing so very powerful tool and much more relevant than this this is really just a way of drawing pretty pictures whereas the online um, RF courage map actually gives you proper uh, sensible information and it will even um, has a little wizard that you can run which will actually do um, auto placement of access points. So you can say this is the area I want to cover, um, these sections I don't care about, now go and tell me which access points I need to put in and where. And it will trot off and it will actually tell you where the best position for your access points depending upon the coverage that you've uh, predefined in it. Very powerful tool. So this one, it's really there to give pretty pictures, uh, not much more. <clears throat> However, if you still wanted to continue with this, uh, the first stage is you actually need to give it a scale. So this is the same tool really as, as on the fantastic or much better online program. So uh, you say, right, I'm going to draw a line on here. And this represents 10 meters on this plan. And then it will go through and try to make a more realistic uh, indication of the degradation of the signal. But yet again, it doesn't take into account the walls. So, hmm bit useless and here's another picture saying look at these two access points wow not only covering this uh, floor with this fantastic amount of RF signal they're actually covering the whole of the outside as well wow these access points are really good okay a bit tongue-in-cheek pretty pictures not much better if you want a more realistic tool go look at the ingenious.com.sg Singapore website for their online tool Uh, so uh, let's continue with the monitoring tool. So under monitoring, you've got active clients. So under active clients, you've got a list of the connected clients, um, access point they're connected to, their fingerprinting, the operating system, the SSID they're connected to, uh, signal strength and the amount of data they've got through. In. And you've also got kick and ban options here for specific clients as well. 
So uh, ban means uh, permanently kick them off and uh, kick means temporarily kick them off. So you've got kick and ban tools there as well. What else we got? Right, we've got a similar set of tools for the actual access point. So if we go down to Sysdix access point, here we can actually get information about the connected number of clients and the throughput of the access points on our network. And if we click on one of these, we get a more detailed um, scrolling display or indication over the last 24 hours of the clients and the traffic for that specific access point. And also if we um, click on one of these um, bars that we've got here, we can actually get more detailed information telling you the name of the access point, the throughput and the connected number of clients on that access point. And also we can, there's, uh, we can get tools which actually show us the breakdown of the individual clients that are connected to the access point, including their throughput traffic. Like, whoa, what's this guy with this iPad doing? Oh, we've got any downloading going on here that we want to know about. So we've actually got that information available there as well. And we can click on the client and actually tell us information about MAC address and the total amount of data they've gone up and down. Okay. Uh, we've also got real-time throughput monitoring. So this enables us to select an access point and actually look at a real-time graph of the data throughput over the last couple of minutes. And we've got logs, so we can look at logging for the controller switch or the clients or all of them. So this actually gives us log events of what's happening going on with the uh, LAN ports and the access points and the clients in the log. What else we got? Ah, this is probably more, more, more useful. So this is alerts, so this is email alerts. So with email alerts, what we can do is we can specify an administrator's email address who will actually get emails um, when a selective events occur. And this is a list of the selected events. So the status of the controller changes, for example, or there's a firmware update available or the status of the access point change. Anyway, you can tick the events and, um, an email will actually be sent uh, according to the information you've sent here to the specific administrator when those events occur. So now we're going to look at the uh, the hotspot service, the hotspot gateway. Um, as I've mentioned before, I think it's a little bit rubbish. Um, it's not uh, a true sophisticated hotspot gateway service, so it won't do PayPal authentication, charging, social media logging. It won't do any of that. It really is more of a just a Hey, you've connected to the wireless network. Please tick here to confirm you conf uh, you agree to the TNCs, and let's continue from there. But let's show you what what it means, what's what's involved. So this is part of the radio settings for the group. If you go down to the bottom radio settings, you'll notice there's this section called Guest Network. There's a Guest Network SSID for 2.4 and/or 5 gig. By default they're disabled but if you want to enable them all you do is you click on the one you want to enable that then brings up the ssid the guest you can then change the guest ssid and says some security on the ssid now underneath here you notice there's ip settings so the way the guest network works is each access point is a um, private wi-fi router so when a client connects to the access point, it's like he's connecting to a Wi-Fi router. So he's dished out an IP address by the access point. And the advantage of each access point acting as a router is um, very good isolation between the clients on different routers and the clients on the main network. So you get very good isolation doing it that way. And the downside is you have no roaming capabilities of clients um, between the access points. So if they're connected to access point number one, they basically are having to do a reauthorization when they go to the next access point. So there's no roaming between the access points. Uh, and the other thing, of course, is we've got this thing called Captive Portal, which basically is that splash and go thing I was mentioning. So if you enable Captive Portal, and then you go down to Hotspot Service Captive Portal, when on that screen, you'll notice that there are three options. You've got Splash and Go. That's, hey, just pop up with a page that says, Welcome to Joe's CAF. Please tick here to see our fantastic free Wi-Fi. 
uh, also has the capability to do a um, uploaded uh, user uh, user base um, it's a bit crude my thing is nobody ever uses these it really is just a splash and go and if you do splash and go you've got the capabilities here to do a simple um, um, login page so you can select a logo a message and do you want T's and C's if you want you could actually redirect users to external URL as well um, so you do that you put your logo in do you want to enable T's and C's yes or no and at the bottom you've got you can set timeouts for how long the client can stay connected for do you kick them off after 30 minutes if they haven't done anything that sort of thing so a bit on the simple side um, but it does give you a splash and go functionality once you've set all that up you just click on apply and you've then set up the captive portal for the guest network as per the settings in the group mention uh, the previous couple of slides uh so final few odds and sods i couldn't really think where to put them under so i put them under maintenance so the ability to um save and reload configurations that's done through this backup icon in the top right of the screen so you click on that and that gives you a case to back up the configuration of the switch remember this is a switch and a controller built in so the switch part the controller part or both so you can back up and or restore so you select what you want then click on apply click on save file tell it where to save the file go ahead and save it right troubleshooting function troubleshooting function is a tool whereby it tries to analyze the network to see if there's anything untoward which doesn't seem quite right so when you go to troubleshooting and you click on show all what it will do is it'll scan the network to see if there's anything looking a little bit weird so in this instance it scanned the network and it said well there's an ap that seems to be connected but it's not very responsive is there something wrong suggest try rebooting the ap or something like that so it tries to analyze the network to see if there's anything going on untoward on the network um firmware upgrade now normally you'd use the automatic tool um but this is a system whereby um you can actually um uh, upload a, a firmware file which you should get from yet again the ingenious.com singapore website please don't go to the american site or any strange eu site to get the firmware file because we've had several instances where people have gone off and got some dodgy firmware and killed products go straight to the horse's mouth uh, go to the ingenious singapore website find the file you can then download the file and then you can upload the file onto the controller so here we are we've clicked on upload we've browsed we've uploaded the file into the controller so now we have the file into the controller now we can do a device list select the access points and once we select the access points we can um, apply that firmware file to those access points so that's the way of manually bulk uploading uh, firmwares however nine times out of ten you'll probably want to do it by the um, automatic system so with the automatic system it should by default come up and warn you there's a firmware update in which case you can go through the process of uh, telling it to go ahead and uh, automatically do the firmware uploads for you there's also a facility whereby you can actually um, just go and do a, uh, a check to see if there's anything available so this is a manual check to see if there's anything available so when you do a manual check it will actually say where do you want to go to check for the firmware updates and um, do you want to do it automatically or do you want to do it manually so by default it will go to the ingenious website to find the firmware updates for you you could if you want actually specify uh, an independent site i don't know anybody who's ever done that everybody i know has ever done this has actually done it through the actual ingenious website so let's let you what else we've got here uh, if you do check for updates and there's nothing available then basically it'll come up and say all devices are up to date um 
Final thing in here, we can enable or disable the functions for automatic firmware update checking. Uh, now, this is probably more important or more imp uh, more relevant, is you can push schedule tasks. So by default under maintenance, if you click on schedule tasks, there are no tasks there. So you click on add and it comes up with a, a screen and allow you to choose tasks that you want to happen at certain predefined times of day. So, for example, this is say we're going to create a task called Power the AP, enabled it. What this is going to do is it's going to enable or disable the power on a lamp or of the switch. So these are the ports that we want to change the state. And what we want to do is disable the power on those ports at midnight on every day of the week. So it just gives us a way of actually doing advanced things like um, we can turn off SSIDs and we can turn off the whole PoE. Um, we can even make it reboot the PoE coming out of it to actually bounce the uh, bounce the access point. So we can do all those sort of sexy things through these scheduled tasks. Uh, a few odds and sods have got left now to discuss. So uh, we can also do things like reboot the access point. So that's under the access point list and device management. We can actually specify access points and manually reboot them. We put this thing called Rogue AP Detection. I don't know if you noticed on one of the previous slides when we were talking about that background scanning. It also mentioned that as part of the background scanning, the access points are also checking the environment to see if there's any access points which it doesn't know anything about. So these are what are called Rogue Access Points. So anytime you can come to the screen and it will give you a list of other access points, other Wi-Fi networks it can see in the environments. So it'll tell you the uh, SSID for those, um, the channel they're on, the band, the type of security they're running, and which access points, which neutron access points on the system detected them, and the signal strength. It's it's a nice pretty pity picture. Uh, I'm not convinced of its worth. So this is telling us that there are what um, ten or so Wi-Fi networks available, which you can see in the in the neighbourhood. Doesn't really tell us much. So what? Anyway, it's got the tool there. So that was a, uh, a PowerPoint run through of the various setup screens and configuration screens of the actual of a Neutron system. Now, what I'm going to do in the next video is actually give a live hands on demonstration of the Neutron setup. So I'll go through the setup, go through the basic configuration setup, what you need to do, IP changes, that sort of thing, firmware updates, that sort of thing. So you can actually get more of a feel for what it's like doing a real world, uh, a real live setup of a neutron system. And thank you very much.